we're joined here at the United States Naval Academy for the annual McCain Conference, sponsored by the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership and also supported by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. We're joined by uh, Martin Levicki from the RAND Corporation to discuss some of the ethical implications of emerging technology and cyber war as we think about the issue of war in the international environment. Martin, we, we come to uh, take a number of these sort of startling technological changes that have brought robotic systems and cyber war to the battlefield kind of now as, as something not, uh, not terribly novel and in fact even routine. Uh, what do you think are some of the emerging other changes and how do you think this might affect how we think about war and is cyber war really a possibility or in fact even ongoing? I think there are two ways you have to look at cyber war. First of all, you have to look at it in terms of cyber operations in the context of a regular, of a conventional, a conventional war. I think it's safe to assume that if one or both sides brings systems to the battlefield, the other side is going to try to get into and disrupt those systems if not collect intelligence against them. However, the notion of cyber war also can be discussed at the strategic level. That is, one state attacking the civilian infrastructures, the dual-use infrastructures of another state in order to, for purposes of dissuasion or compulsion, for purposes of coercion. It's not entirely clear that we're going to see that much of that kind of combat because it raises strategic issues that are not necessarily confinable to the battlefield. Um, well, what are some of the ethical implications we might see due to this, uh, the advent of so-called cyber war or the use, perhaps, right. of cyber weapons? Do we have to think differently about how we develop military leaders or even how we think about war more generally? I think the ethical issues of cyber war are going to be ones not of how much harm you can do to folks because it's characteristic of cyber war that it's very difficult to hurt anybody. We've had 15 to 20 years of computer hacking already and nobody, as far as anybody knows, has ever died from it. Nobody's ever been hurt from that sort of stuff. There's been damage, but, but no casualties as we would understand them. And then in many ways becomes the ethical problem. Because there are no casualties, people may feel freer to use these weapons against non-military targets in ways that they wouldn't have thought of for weaponry that could actually uh, kill, folks, kill folks or hurt people. And so the danger exists that people who don't understand cyber war very well, and it's not clear that anybody understands it very well at this point, because it's a subject that is uh, rife with ambiguity, rife with confusion, may in fact start to launch these, these operations thinking that the consequences are relatively harmless and can be taken back, only to find out that the victims don't react that way. That in fact there's an escalation into violence from, from a starting point that was not itself violent. I think the requirement of cyber war, if you're going to seriously get into it outside a military context, that is outside a strictly force on force issue, is to try to understand the ramifications from a strategic and then ethical point of view well before you actually start its use. The, the issue is not that we haven't answered the ethical questions. The issue is we have not thought very strongly about the strategic issues associated with cyber combat. Let me press you on that for one second longer, Martin. There have been allegations, for example, that the Russian Federation has used uh, cyber weaponry or even cyber war against some of the Baltic republics. Also, there were allegations that the Russians used these uh, during their uh, war with Georgia about a year or so ago. Uh, might the advent of these weapons actually encourage uh, civilian political leaders to resort to war of some form because of some of the reasons you said that individuals may not be physically injured or killed by them? Well, what I would argue what took place in Estonia, which may or may not have been the Russian government, I would say 50-50 odds at this point, and even more in Georgia, was relatively minor. If you go back to what took place in Estonia in 2007, there were riots. Somebody was actually killed. The publicity, however, stems from the cyber attack that was carried out in Estonia. Um, and very few people understood that there were, in, action, in fact, physical riots and, and, and physical casualties from that combat. When we take a look at Georgia, the use of Russia's cyber attack capabilities against essentially Georgian media uh, got a great deal of publicity. But in terms of the fraction of the amount of harm and grief it caused, the fact that several hundred people, I believe, were killed in the Georgian conflict, uh, the fact that a great deal of material was destroyed in the Georgia conflict, was in my view a great deal more important. So we take a look at cyber as a harbinger of future wars, doesn't necessarily mean that in any near time 
um, context, it's going to necessarily be more destructive. What it is is more interesting, and people tend to focus on what's interesting and new. This isn't to say that at some point further out point, when people have thought this through, there may not be really destructive uses of cyber war. It just hasn't happened yet. One of the aspects of the laws of land warfare that we talk about is, of course, the aspect of discrimination. Can we discriminate our targeting so we focus on combatants right. and don't, or to the maximum extent possible, limit civilian mm -hmm. casualties? Might the use of cyber weapons allow for greater discrimination? We've seen a great concern about civilian casualties in the wars the United States mm -hmm. conducts in Afghanistan, in Iraq, previous conflicts we've been involved in recently in the Balkans and Kosovo. So might this out actually allow us a greater discrimination in target? Well, it allows greater discrimination in the sense that you don't have blast effects. And that military networks tend to be separated from civilian networks uh, to a fairly high degree. But if you're going after dual use facilities, for instance, a telephone switchboard that supports both military command and control, and that which supports the civilian infrastructure, then discrimination becomes very, very difficult. A lot depends on your targeting philosophy. If you're just going after SAM sites, you're probably going to be in good shape. If you go more broadly, then you have a, a series of risks. One of the problems in terms of predicting collateral damage is that you don't have the laws of physics to fall back on. And so from your perspective, the collateral damage may be highly unpredictable and highly irregular. Is there a role for deterrence as we think about cyber weapons and cyber warfare? Obviously, deterrence was a central mm -hmm. feature as we thought about the nuclear weaponry and the possible of mm -hmm. nuclear war. Many would argue the purpose of nuclear weapons was simply to deter other nuclear weapons. That was, and many now actually talk about mm -hmm. conventional deterrence. So is there a, role, a deterrent role for cyber weapons? Well, there's always a deterrent role for cyber weapons, but I would argue that it tends to be exaggerated. The word deterrence and the word terror come from the same root. It's to create fear, and there was an elemental issue of fear when you dealt with nuclear weapons for obvious reasons. That same fear does not occur with, with cyber weapons. So from a psychological point of view, the deterring effect of the use of cyber weapons, the threat to use cyber weapons, doesn't carry anywhere near, near the impact. But if you also can talk deterrence in terms of more basic dissuasion, if you hit me with a cyber attack, I'm going to respond to you with a cyber attack, becomes very problematic in cyberspace because of the difficulty of knowing who's done anything. So if something happens to you, you might think it was the Chinese, the Russians, the, the French, you know, n name your bet noir in, in this particular instance. But you may not necessarily have proof ex unless the fellow who attacked you stands up and says, it was, I, it was me who attacked you. In which sense, you're retaliating not against the attack, but against the infantry to take credit for the attack, which is something different entirely. When you talk about tanks rolling across the border, and when you're talking for the most part about nuclear weapons, people don't worry about attribution all that much, because it's relatively straightforward. In cyberspace, if an attacker wants to hide his identity, that's not very difficult. And you're going to be operating in a cloud of ambiguity when you try to strike back, which in turn raises the ethical issues. What level of confidence do you have to assume in order to strike back against the folks that you thought were the attacker? You take a look at US intelligence in the last 10 years, we've made a lot of mistakes. And one of the issues about cyber warfare is it's the intelligence community, which has a responsibility for coming back and saying, well, it was China, Russia, France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the intelligence community operates in places where people cannot, as it were, second guess it. They're, they don't produce evidence subject to, pu to public disclosure. And so you're going to have in cyber war a lot of the same difficulties you had with the war in Iraq. How do we know that this threat exists? How do we know that something took place? Well, we don't. Or often we won't. So we we'll assume that, of course, the United States is a very advanced technological country would have a major advantage in cyber weapons or cyber defenses. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the last few weeks and months, we've seen the formation of the new cyber command, if you will, to try to bring together many of the mm -hmm. assets we have for defensive and well as offensive purposes. We've heard senior mm -hmm. defense officials say that, you know, in many ways, we're under continuous uh, cyber attack. So what's going on in other countries around the world in terms of developing cyber weapons? And is there the possibility that, you know, terrorist organizations might also take advantage of these particular weapons for particularly mm -hmm. asymmetrical type attacks? Well, you've asked many questions at the same time. Let me see if I can get to, get to them. Um, a nation's ability to carry out cyber war is roughly proportional to the nation's ability to train mathematicians and people of a mathematical ilk. Uh, 
uh, you don't have to be terribly rich. The Russian economy, for instance, is a sort of a is in many ways a petrostate. It's not an affluent economy. But Russia has been traditionally very good at, at training mathematicians. Uh, China has a huge manpower base. India has a huge manpower base. Israel has shown itself to be capable of training a lot of people that are very clever in this, in this particular realm. Conversely, the United States has as much or more to lose than any other country because we are so dependent on our information infrastructure. So that on the one hand, whereas the United States probably has better capabilities than others, it also has uh, worse vulnerabilities. In terms of specifically what other countries are doing, one can only speculate. In fact, if I knew, I couldn't tell you. Rest assured, I don't know very much. We do have our intelligence out there. We do have a sense of some of the techniques that we're using, that they are using. We may not necessarily have a good sense of what techniques they have that they haven't used yet. And that's a problem with intelligence. And so one can only speculate. In terms of the third question about terrorism, there has been a great deal of speculation that terrorists would, in fact, use cyber weapons. We have seen zero evidence to date that they have shown any interest in it. I think, to a large extent, that's for two reasons. One, it doesn't produce the kind of visuals, the kind of dramatic statement. Terrorism has been known as propaganda of the deed. And so for that reason, uh, shutting off the lights, um, as opposed to, say, blowing up a transmission tower, doesn't necessarily have the same impact. Secondly, it's the amount of ambiguity in cyberspace that makes it very difficult to, in fact, carry out, att have attribution for certain things and have credible attribution. So I'm not saying it can happen, but I am saying we need to see our first one for, before we start worrying too much about the terrorists. You know, there's an assumption, at least, that uh, war is conducted consistent with laws of land warfare that have been around for, for a long time, as well as uh, international obligations, certain treaties. Uh, people would point to the Geneva Convention, for mm -hmm. example. Is there a need, as we think through these new weaponry, to review uh, some of these legal norms? Uh, for example, you know, how do we define uh, what is meant by a combatant? if you're talking about cyber war, mm -hmm. where it's obviously very clear if you're talking about a soldier on the battlefield wearing a uniform. Right. The reason that soldiers wear battlefields on the uniform is that they can be treated as prisoners of war if apprehended, so that you, can, you don't go after civilians thinking they might be soldiers. In cyberspace, that distinction is completely irrelevant. And in fact, in any long-range combat where the chances that you get a prisoner of war are close to zero, such as flying UAVs, the distinction for all practical, pur all practical purposes is irrelevant. There are many other aspects of the laws of armed conflict, but they just don't apply to cyberspace very well. Um, neutrality, proportionality, uh, collateral damage, all of them look a lot different in the cyber domain. And if we are to have cyber war among gentlemen, which is a problematic notion of its own, these, these sorts of issues, ethical issues are going to have to be reconsidered from first principles. Well, Martin, on behalf of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy and the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, I want to thank you very much for a very interesting and stimulating discussion on cyber warfare. Thank you and, very much. And thank you for inviting me.